main things that I wanted to cover today were ultrafiltration and some, some examples and just a bit more explanation of some theory. But before starting that, just to quickly talk about the project topics. Now, the projects are run in 4M and typically I release them about a week ago um, normally, but because of midterms and so forth, this is actually a better time to release it. And what I've done is also extended the due date a week further. So it's still the same amount of time to do the project. Um, it's just the timing of the way that Thanksgiving is a little bit later and, and um, the midterm that it, the timing works better now for the project. And the projects this year are focused on three main areas that you can pick one of. You don't uh, do all three, you only pick one of the topics. And they're related to membranes, separative reactors, and bioseparation. So one of those three um, you may have an interest in and would like to look at a bit more of that topic. So the way the project is structured is um, once you've selected your topic, um, there's more on the course website, but essentially what you'll be doing is you'll be writing a very short eight-page report electronically in Google Docs, and your report looks at that application area where it's used, describing an application of that particular topic. So tell me a bit about what is separated from what. If you've picked um, a bioseparation, for example, you could talk about enzymes being separated, separated reactors, or um, the first topic there on membranes. So tell me a bit about an application, um, where it's used, what the, how that unit is operated day to day. So for example, in the membrane area, you would talk about cleaning the membrane periodically, um, how the unit is typically operated. So that's the first part of the report. The second part of the report is you will tell me about an alternative technology. So every one of these methods up here has an alternative technology that might be used for the application you've chosen. So you talk just a short one page on that. And then the remaining three, uh, four or five pages of the report um, describe to me what the answers are to the questions I've posed here. Okay? So, so if you're looking at the membrane topic, it's looking at how membranes are produced, how we can make modifications to the membrane to operate at higher temperatures, um, and so forth. Separative reactors, I've posed some questions on the course website, and bioseparations, I've posed some questions. Okay, so it's a very short eight-page report. Um, there are very specific instructions on the electronic submission for the report, so please follow those carefully. Um, they're all on the website. <coughs> Any questions on the report topic? Yeah. Is it double-spaced? Uh, it's all um, it's electronic submission in Google Doc using the default settings in Google Docs. So you start a Google Doc, you use whatever font settings there are. Yeah. There's a video on the course website that shows how to use Google Docs if you've not used it before. Anything else? Okay, so, um, so that's due about a month from now at class time, but it's an electronic submission. So let's look back at ultrafiltration here, and what I wanted to quickly recap, uh, Sean Johnson gave a really good overview of membranes in general, and uh, GE's business in membranes is very strongly related to ultrafiltration. So you'll recall um, Sean's talk, he emphasized several times about bacteria, and their membranes ensure that bacteria are excluded. So the way they do that is by ensuring that the pore sizes here for these membranes are small enough so that the virus or bacteria will not be able to physically pass through it. So it's based on a physical separation of the, <laughs> the, the particles. And uh, those first numbers up there, five to, to 100 nanometers, gives you an idea of the particle size that's being retained by the membrane. So Sean gave some details of various virus sizes. Viruses are, um, have got various uh, physical sizes and so the, the pore openings um, are small enough to ensure that those viruses cannot pass through. So here's the picture I want you to have in your mind when we're looking at this topic. Is imagine a membrane and I'm drawing a solid line up here just to illustrate the part that nothing passes through. So we have our feed coming in, and all the activity of separation is taking place here at the membrane surface. 
So this dashed line is the membrane effect. Okay. So your solid particles are being retained. They're large enough that they can't go through those openings. And what we're seeing through that is my fluid flows through, but also passes through. Okay, and, and as we call this, the permeate. And this stream here is being called the retentate. So the terminology we're going to start adding, and this is uh, in, in today's class, might be fairly new for us, is we're going to call the concentration of the solids in the permeate stream CP. So that is kilogram solids per meter cubed of permeate. The retentate uh, we'll call CR. Again, kilograms of solids per meter cubed of retentate. And similarly for the feed. So we'll call it C0 or CF. Kilograms of solids per meter cubed of feed. So that's uh, the concentrations. We also have flow rates. We'll see those coming up. We'll call these Q0 volumetric flow rates, QP and QR. For example, this would be meters cubed of retentate per unit time. So it's a volumetric flow rate. QP would be meters cubed of permeate per unit time. And the number that we're most interested in typically is that flux JV. Let's just take a look at that um, up here. JV is a measure of the permeate flow. Remember the flux is what passes through the membrane. Um, let me just emphasize that. Yeah, so this is my flux of material passes through the membrane and the subscript V indicates to us that JV here, that flux is the volumetric flux and the units we'll most often use is meters cubed meter squared hour. So volumetric flow rate meters cubed per hour per unit area. In the literature, we'll often just make a small unit change, multiply that by a thousand, and we get units of liters per meter squared hour. Okay, so you've got the volumetric flow per unit area. And liters per meter squared hour will give a name, a shorthand name, LMH. So that's an important uh, term that often shows up in the water treatment literature related to membranes. Is how much permeate do you get through? This, remember, is your desired product. In water treatment, your permeate is the desired product, your clean water. So what is your LMH, what is your volumetric flow that you can achieve per unit area is your key number. Um, that you want to aim for. Okay, so that's just a bit of terminology we're going to start to use. Now, these, um, these membranes then, I went through this slide last time, so we don't need to cover it again. I just gave you an idea of where ultrafiltration is used. Just to quickly recap there, it's um, ultrafiltration is probably one of the most widely used forms of membrane separations. Oils, dyes, paints, uh, food products, bioprocessing, um, it's a very, very widely applied separation for membranes because a lot of solids of interest fall in that range. So it's not uncommon that ultrafiltration is one of the most widely used membrane steps. Uh, we've also gone through the, this notation there, so I won't recap that. The only new word there that we haven't seen yet, in fact, is solute. So solute here um, is just an equivalent for solids. So it's the part that's retained on the inside of the membrane and deposited against the membrane wall. 
And so the, when I say kilograms of solids per meter cubed of retentate, <coughs> I'll sometimes say kilograms of solutes per meter cubed of retentate, the same, same term. Now, the number that GE is most interested in, and we saw this uh, equation in Sean's presentation as well, is this number R, okay, the rejection coefficient. In ultrafiltration, this is your, one of your critical numbers to tell you how well your membrane is able to reject solids. So let's um, take a look at this graph. R is in fact not a single number, it's an entire curve. And the way it works is um, we look at various sizes. Now, the size of the molecule is directly proportional to molecular weight. So you could also look at this from a molecular weight perspective. But basically, this horizontal axis is size. And this axis here tells you which sizes of the particles are retained and which sizes of the particles pass through the membrane. So if we look at this equation, um, let's just break it down. R, the rejection coefficient, the value plotted on the vertical axis, is 1 minus the permeate concentration over the feed concentration. So extremely large particles, let's work from this side, extremely large particles, those are retained completely on the inside of the membrane leaving nothing to pass through the permeate. So C permeate for your very largest particles will be zero, essentially. And it doesn't matter what the denominator is, because that numerator is zero. So one minus zero is one. So your extremely large particles, you'll be able to reject completely. Your extremely small particles will pass entirely through the membrane. Um, and what that means is that essentially your permeate concentration is the same as your feed concentration. So your smallest particles just zip right through. So what's coming in is the same as what passes through. That ratio there is 1, and 1 minus 1 is 0. So the two extremes are 0 and 1, and then we have this S-shaped curve in between. So this is not a surprising curve to us. We've seen this, in fact, with particle size distribution. Back a few classes ago, we saw the same S-shaped curve and I, in fact, had used the same language that's up here. The, the two areas, water treatment and solids treatment, use the same term, diffuse and sharp, to describe these curves. So here's a very sharp curve. It's got a steep rise. A diffuse curve has got a very um, broad rejection range. Okay? But it's, it's imperfect. A diffuse curve means that material that's sort of in this range, some of it passes through, some of it doesn't whereas sharp indicates that you've got a very narrow band where it's either zero or one, and then there's a very narrow step in between. So ideally, we would love sharp membranes, right? We would love a sharp cutoff, so we've got a very steep um, rise over there, but we can't, we can't guarantee that. And the reason why we can't guarantee that is because when we make these membranes, um, here, let's just take a look at some of these, these high-resolution images here. When we make these membranes, the pores openings are not all uniformly the same size. So some pores are, are a little larger, allowing material through, and um, as a result of that, because every pore is not the same size, we, we don't get that steep, um, sharp cutoff. And then the final number that Sean mentioned, that this is a critical uh, term, MWCO, molecular weight cutoff. MWCO, molecular weight cutoff. That is a number, it's an arbitrary number, where the rejection coefficient is 90%. Okay? So what we do there is we simply follow the 90% line across, and wherever that crosses the curve and comes down, that's the molecular weight cutoff point for that membrane. So essentially what we have here, these, these two black lines are two lines for two different membranes. This is a key point. Every line represents one membrane. When you go buy a membrane from a supplier, you pick, you can look at this from their supply list, and you can pick to use this membrane, or you may choose to spend more money and buy this membrane with a sharper cutoff. So the sharper cutoff in this particular instance, 
has an MWCO of 10,000. This diffuse membrane curve in that instance has an MWCO of 100,000. But you can purchase your membrane to have a particular molecular weight color. So, so there's a lot of important concepts on that slide, and I want to just check if there's any questions before moving on. Okay, nothing just yet. So, so let's take a look now at, um, uh, perhaps let me show a bit more to this. Let's go look, I'm just going to jump a few slides ahead if you don't mind. Uh, there was, in later on in your notes, we have some images of the internals of some of these membranes. Okay, it's a little bit back. So this is around slide 42, I think. Yeah, so 42, 41. Okay, and I just want to actually, because this, this always causes an issue. People um, have this picture in mind that I've drawn here on the board. But let's take a look at how that applies to this particular membrane. So in this membrane, uh, we saw earlier that our feed comes in the center and the membrane surface is that edge over there and then this rest of it is just a support structure. So your permeate flows out through that. So feed in the center, it's called inside out flow. You're flowing from, from in that direction. Now, take a look at this diagram. In this diagram, that doesn't represent what I've just shown there. Right? In this diagram, you're feeding in the center, and the membrane is entirely around you. So a, a truer representation for that instance is that this line isn't actually there. And if we look at that membrane, we can see that my feed coming in can now permeate through on the top of the cylinder or the bottom of the cylinder. I've drawn it lying on its side. Okay. Okay, so you've got the entire cross-sectional area of that or internal area of that uh, pore for the permeate to flow out. <coughs> okay, but so conceptually the picture that I had isn't wrong. Uh, essentially what I've drawn then only is one half of the, the pore for you. So I'm just drawing a cutaway. But this is the model that we're going to use in our, in our mind. And just simply consider flux in this one direction. But in a, in a cylinder, we, just, we, can, we can account for the fact that we've got flux going out in all directions. Okay. So, so that's uh, just a mental picture. Now where this uh, picture that I've drawn here does work is with this example. So let's take a look at it. In this example, this, this is a little bit confusing initially, and I'll show you a video to, um, em, um, to see how this works. You've got your feed coming in, and your feed is able to enter in through um, this spiral wound membrane. And all that the spiral wound membrane is, is alternating sequences of a feed channel and a membrane and a permeate channel. So you take three layers, put them down flat on a flat sheet, and at the end of the production line, you take those layers and you just roll them up into a spiral. And essentially what your feed does is it channels in and then the permeate passes through the spirals and in, enters the center tube, allowing your retentate to continue on. So this visual image works then in that case. Okay. So the, this is uh, best observed with the video. Let's take a look at that. Um, there's a bit of voice over here, so I'll play that over to you, and um, there's some interesting comments that the person makes. So, To create our standard spiral wound membranes, we construct the flat sheet membrane using hydronautics automated casting equipment. We begin the process with a fabric support base and then coat it with a microporous polysulfone layer. This provides additional support for the top 0.2 micron thick membrane barrier layer. This top barrier layer makes the actual separation to purify the water. The semi-permeable polyamide layer consists of a thin film of polymeric material, a few thousand angstroms thick, formed on a porous supporting material. 
semi-permeable membrane skin is formed on the polysulfone substrate by interfacial polymerization of monomers containing amine and carboxylic acid chloride functional groups. Hydronautics manufacturing procedure enables independent optimization of the distinct properties of the membrane support and salt rejecting skin. The combination of these three layers makes a durable membrane flat sheet that is used in each spiral wound element. The membrane flat sheet is then combined with a sheet of feed channel spacer. This provides turbulence and creates space between the membrane sheets to allow uniform flow of the water to the entire membrane surface. The leaves of membrane and feed channel spacer are then combined with a sheet of permeate spacer which provides open flow channels for the permeate even under high pressure. The leaves are glued along each of the three exposed sides and then rolled around the core tube. With the back of the membrane completely sealed to the edges of the permeate spacer, the feed water is forced through the feed channel spacer, contacting the front or barrier layer of the membrane. Clean water, or permeate, passes through the membrane surface into the permeate channel and then flows in a spiral direction to the center of the element and is collected into the core tube. Hydronautic spiral wound elements can then be loaded into pressure vessels and interconnected with additional elements to complete any number of design specifications. Once the end adapter is connected to the last element and the pressure vessel is sealed, feed water can be introduced and then treated. The feed water that does not permeate through the membrane becomes enriched in salts as it travels through the feed channel spacer due to permeate water being removed. Typically, 8-10% to of the water is removed in one 40-inch long membrane element. The permeate water then flows out the end of the vessel and is collected as the product. And the reject or concentrate from that vessel may then flow through another vessel producing more permeate. The remaining concentrate may then be disposed of as waste or partially recycled as the feed. Typically, 70 to 90% of the water can be recovered as pure product water. Okay, so that gives you a, a visual then of those spiral wound membranes. And what we're doing then is taking those spiral wound membranes, each one of these modules has a fixed area. So we know the surface area of the membrane inside there. And if we need a certain flux, we can just add these membranes in essentially parallel. So I, I showed this to you in a prior class. I'll just zoom in here again. We've got this, this uh, vertical pipe here called a header and that's your feed coming in at a, at a certain flow rate at a certain concentration so there's your C naught concentration you've got your feed flow rate Q naught and it's being split into each one of these modules which has a fixed area and the material passes through you've got your retentate leaving and your permeate leaving okay so your feed comes in and is simply distributed across multiple membranes. If you had to draw a flow sheet of that, uh, the representation to, to use is essentially the following. We've seen, seen some of this in the prior class. I'll just add to it. So you've got your feed coming in, capital Q, and it's being spread across multiple membranes. So essentially here, we're taking that feed and splitting it. I'll just draw three, for example. And you've got your permeate passing through. And what we'll do is we can collect these permeate streams up and have one QP leaving. So this is your permeate flow. And the retentate I'll just draw here in red. The retentate leads over there. Okay. And we can 
sum up all those three flows and we get QR, total return tank flow. Okay, so each, each of these membranes sees a certain volumetric flow rate, Q, and then processes it, and then we get we sum up our permeates, sum up our retentates. The important point is whatever this feed concentration is C naught is the same C naught that goes in here. The concentration of the bulk feed is the same as the individual concentrations going in. So concentration um, is is that sort of property. Q Obviously, Q will split. So if we split the feed three ways, each one of these is one third, one third, one third. But the concentration is the same concentration. So uh, this is an example of, of a membrane then. This photo comes from a, a water treatment process on an island uh, in Cyprus. And it's used to treat seawater uh, in reverse osmosis manner. So we're covering reverse osmosis in the next class. Um, and treats and creates a whole lot of fresh drinking water for that island. Now, what I wanted to cover in, um, in the class today was also this idea that there's a layer of buildup on the membrane surface. So let's take a look at this. Uh, Sean actually did mention this in the, in the last class. So I wanted to just... Um, go through some of the theory. He just showed the final equation. But let's understand what he was referring to over here. So we'll start from, from the fresh page. And this time I'm going to look at a different flux. So up to now we've been talking about the volumetric flux. As seen here in the top of this slide 34, I'm referring now to solute flux or solids flux. This is an important concept as well. And the visual is the same as before, is flowing through this membrane, we have a volumetric flux, JV. Okay, so this is JV, is my volumetric flux. And it has units of meters cubed of solvent. I'm going to be very specific with with my numerators, meters cubed of solvent per meter squared per unit time. Okay. Now, there's a concentration C over here of solids. C is my concentration of solids, and it's flowing in the liquid phase. So my solids are suspended in the liquids phase <laughs> and flowing towards the membrane. So if I say JV times C, Okay, so the product of JV times C, C is a solids concentration. Now I'm going to get kilograms of solids per meter cubed of solvent or liquid phase. Okay, you can then see that we get a bit of cancellation. And essentially JV times C represents what we call our solute flux. So the product of that is my solute or solid flux. And it's kilograms of solids per meter squared per unit time. Okay, so I'm able to quickly calculate my solids flux as well through the membrane. It's JV times C. And what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the flux so this is the flux of solids interior to the membrane. The solids accumulate here on the surface and then passing through, remember we call that CP, was the permeate solids. So the net solids traveling is JV times C minus CP. The other way you can see that is the net solids traveling is JV times C minus JV times CP. So that's the net solids flux that we have retained inside the membrane. Okay, so that simplifies JV times C minus CP. Now, 
That gives me an idea of the solid's flux in this direction going down. What happens, and this is uh, something you'll appreciate from the mass transfer course that um, Dr. Ghosh taught you, is that the moment you've got solids build up, you've got a solids gradient, there's a concentration gradient occurring here, um, that there's going to be some imbalance in concentration. So remember I said in a prior class, anytime you get a difference in something, you get a driving force set up, you know that stuff is going to be moving. Right, so it's a, it's a, we know that from nature. If this solid's concentration at the wall is high, the solid's concentration over there in the bulk is low, we're seeing a concentration gradient, and so we're going to see diffusion, in fact, of your solids back out to the lower concentration direction. So we actually see diffusion occurring in the opposite direction. So Sean had shown the diffusion equation in the prior class, and the diffusion flux then is the diffusivity of solute in solvent, DAB, times the concentration gradient, CDY, where Y refers to the distance. So Y is your distance from the membrane surface. That's considered distance zero over here, and then this is the Y direction. <coughs> so we're seeing a diffusion of back into back into the solution. And what we can do then is, um, at steady state, those two are equal to each other. We've got flux of the solutes towards the membrane due to the pressure difference, but then we've got diffusion away from the membrane due to the concentration difference. So two, two driving forces, a delta P in one way and a delta C in the other way. And at steady state, those must come to some equilibrium. And what we do then is set those two terms equal to each other to find what that diffusion, uh, sorry, the net uh, transfer looks like. So we set those two equal to each other. We can integrate from our zero condition over here is zero for the distance y up to some distance into the, into the um, membrane. We call that LC. And at this initial condition, our concentration is CW, the wall concentration, up into the bulk CB. So those are my two integral limits. Integrate and we get um, a standard logarithmic term over there. Now, I'm going to just quickly pause and rewrite this last equation on the, this board over here. And we're going to make a small simplification for ourselves. That will explain why we're seeing a lot of terms that keep coming up. Okay, so the integral log of the wall concentration minus the bulk concentration, CB minus CP, the permanent concentration, is then equal to JB over HW. Now, HW is your mass transfer coefficient. Uh, HW is essentially wraps up LC, which we don't know. We don't know this distance in, how deep, how deep that cake is. And we don't know our diffusivity. But we, we wrap it up into one number, the mass transfer coefficient. And if we assume that CP, sorry, this numerator was wrong, CP. So we've got two CP terms there. If we assume CP is small or close to zero, a very reasonable assumption if we're retaining all or most of our solids on the interior of the membrane, then that simplifies very, very nicely into this form. And I'm going to rewrite that equation in the form that we'll actually end up using it. JV is HW times the log of CW of a CB. Okay, this is our net equation we're going to use. Yeah. Um, you said that the, the wall concentration is at the bottom, right? Why isn't it the other way around? Because if it's the bulk, isn't the bulk of your concentration at the bottom? No, bulk refers to the bulk fluid, the main part of the fluid, yeah. I'm going to explain what that means here. So JV is our flux. Okay, JV is my flux of liquid passing through the membrane. And another way we can write JV is as QP over A. 
That's another way of writing JD. The volumetric flow per, per unit time, QP remember is meters cubed per hour, let's perhaps write it out. Meters cubed per hour, that's the units of QP, and then per unit area. Okay. So if we look at those units, that's a, jointly this entire uh, set of units, meters cubed per hour per meter squared. Those are flux units, so JV is QP over A. So it's another way of writing the left hand side. HW is my mass transfer coefficient. And then we've got the log of two concentrations. So the two concentrations, CW and CB. Well, what are these? So CW is my wall concentration, and CB is my bulk concentration. Let's, um, let's get a good understanding of those. This is going to be critical to us using this equation successfully. So let's look at our, our membrane, and we've got feed flowing in. And what I'm essentially looking at is going to look further down the membrane. Okay, so the initial part of the membrane, there's a bit of um, buildup here of solids, but let's work in this region of the membrane onwards where the solids are fairly built up, and they're more dense at the wall because they're being compacted down. Okay, and over here is my bulk. So flowing along here is my bulk concentration. And this is in fact what is leaving right, right out of the end. So we call this retentate in an earlier class. And that's my retentate leaving. So another way that you can see your bulk concentration, CB, is that it's CR, your retentate concentration. So we've got this dense layer of solids at the, right at your wall, and then it thins out into the bulk of the fluid. The bulk of the fluid is what passes through the membrane and eventually ends up leaving. So CR is the concentration that we use for CB. So if we come back to this equation, let's just update it then as follows. A perfectly valid way of using this equation is to use CR over there. Let's take the next term, CW. CW is your wall concentration. There is no way we would ever be able to figure that concentration out. That's this concentration right here at the membrane wall. We, we have no way of opening up our membrane and measuring that concentration. And our mass transfer co uh, coefficient, HW, is another term that's difficult to, to find. We can go look up some correlations for it. There's textbooks that will give you HW as a function of velocity and temperature and geometry of the channel. But here's the easy way. Experiments. Let's just do a few experiments to figure out what those terms are. So. The simplest experiment is as follows. If we take a look at that equation, if we plot, let me write it out a little bit differently to emphasize it. If I write this equation as follows, I could write it as JV is equal to HW times log of CW minus HW times the log of CR. Okay, so using log laws. And if we plot log of CR here, so log of CR is my y is my x-axis variable. I can change that and I'll show you how we can change that. But we can essentially run the membrane at different retentate concentrations 
and on my vertical axis, I measure my flux JV. And what we'll find then is we'll often get this sort of mostly linear shape as follows. Okay. And the slope of this is minus hw, as you can see from that equation. So the slope is negative hw. The intercept, we can also get the intercept. I'm just make a note of that. The intercept is hw times the log of cw. Okay, so it's fairly straightforward by running several experiments to get the two values we need, hw and CW. Those are our hardest coefficients to obtain. Um, we cannot measure them, so we, we get them experimentally. HW, <coughs> CW. Okay, so perhaps let me um, have you try out using them, using those equations. So here's a, here's a problem that um, asks you to estimate the flux, JV, at different concentrations of the bulk. Okay, so I'll give you a minute just to finish taking down those notes. And Okay, so let me walk you through this problem. Um, we're, we're applying ultrafiltration instead over there, and we're looking at treating a stream that has four kilograms of waste per meter cube of feed. So we know, we know from that that C0 is four kilograms of solids per meter cube feed. And the desired solute concentration, the solids concentration, is 20 kilograms per meter cubed. Okay, so in your membrane here, so again, just look at a one-sided membrane. We're going to have a feed of C0 over there, four kilograms of solids per meter cubed of feed, and what we would like is a solute concentration that's CR of 20 kilograms per meter cube. So CR, 20 kilograms of solids per meter cubed of retentate. In many applications, it's the solid stream that we're interested in, and so that's the concentration leaving that we would like to be able to achieve. Okay, now notice, of course, that C0 is smaller than CR, as it should be, because the solids are being increasing in concentration, because what's happening over here is that the liquid phase is leaving. So you've got liquid leaving here, the solids then become more and more concentrated. Now, this, the only reason why I'm work, working through this question with you is because part one um, asks something that may not seem kind of intuitive. What is the flux JV right at the membrane entrance? Essentially asking, what is this flux right over here, just at the beginning? And the reason for asking that is because we know that solids build up on the membrane. And I said to you in a, in a prior class that these solids build up fairly evenly throughout the membrane. 
because what happens is that they get sheared off and redeposited, sheared off and redeposited. So this layer is fairly constant, but right at the entrance of the membrane, um, that layer is kind of just building up still. Okay. So that's a visual picture to have in mind. And so the concentration that we need to use in this equation, JV, is 0 0.02 times log of 25 over CB. Well, the CB right at the entrance, the bulk concentration right at the entrance of the membrane is which value? C0. Okay. So right at the entrance of the membrane, um, so in part one, CB is equal to four kilograms of solids per meter cube. So it's not typically what we use for CB, and that's why I wanted to emphasize it. And you can calculate what JV is numerically from that um, substitution. Okay, so I'll just uh, report the value for you uh, is 0 0.037. So JV for part one is 0 0.037 uh, meters cubed per hour per meter squared. Okay, so right at the entrance we get that flux. What's that in L of H? Multiplied by a thousand. So 37. Okay, so that's 37 L and H. Okay, so we're getting 37 L and H here. Okay, part two, what is the flux for most of the membrane if we're able to achieve our goal? What is the bulk concentration of that for, to use for part two? CR. CR, okay. So in part two, then, so I'm just gonna, because I don't have too much space here, I don't normally like to do this, but I'm just going to erase what I've done. So in part two, CB is 20 kilograms of solids per meter cubed of feed. And JV then is 0 0.045. So 0 0.0045 meters cubed per hour per meter squared. And in LMH terms, that's 4.5 LMH. So most of the membrane then is actually showing a smaller flux. Yeah, now shouldn't it be uh, meters cubed of per meter instead? Um, oh, sorry, yeah. CB then is 20 kilograms of solids per meters cubed of per minute, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So what I want you to, to think about is what happens if we require a solid concentration of 10 kilograms per hour. So instead of saying I'd like 20 kilograms of solids per hour, I'm happy to accept a weaker concentration of 10. How does that affect the flux? So go and try that out. There's an interesting interpretation over there. And um, we'll examine that in tomorrow's class. Any questions on that? Yeah. How do you calculate like where the um, like the bed is going to be its full of like is it do you like so it's like that L over D times sixty four whatever it is? So. Okay. How do we know where this is? This typically is very very short. Oh. Right. We in fact in, in all our future calculations we'll disregard that. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I'm just I'm illustrating it to you here in the equation form just to show you the difference in flux values and more as a way of how to use this equation. else. Okay, so uh, we'll resume with that example in tomorrow's class.